This video is brought to you by Manscaped.com, the global brand for men's grooming and hygiene products. Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul, and today we're going to party like it's Thor's Day, even though it's Wednesday. Ooh. Now episode 7 of What If is now out, and throughout this video we're going to be breaking down the story, easter eggs, things you missed, and also discussing what could be happening in the future of the series. Full spoilers ahead, so if you haven't checked it out, then check out now. If you enjoy the video then please hammer the thumbs up button and I'll be your adopted brother from another mother if you subscribe to the channel. Without the way, thank you for clicking this, now let's get into What If Episode 7. Okay so the episode is heavily based around Thor and it reimagines the guy if he lived the life of Andrew WK. Showing my age there but Chris Hemsworth has returned to the role and he brings the usual fun that you'd expect from the God of Thunder. For the last couple of weeks we've been somewhat in the multiverse of sadness and in the lead up to this I was expecting Tony Stark to get struck by lightning uh, as the guy just can't seem to catch a break. However it does bring some levity to what's been a very depressing season and it ends with somewhat of an open ending. We know from the trailers that Party Thor will be back before the season closes out and we'll talk about this later on in the video. Now as always we open with the watcher narrating the events of the show and those of you who've been binge watching the series so far might have noticed something about him. When the character first started off in episode 1 he was simply a silhouette amongst the cosmos but as the season's gone on he's got closer and closer and closer. This has got to the point that we can now see his full features and clearly tell that he's basically the baby from the Teletubbies. Now if you've been following our video so far then you'll know we reported on a leaked list that apparently contained all of the episode concepts. According to that this was going to be episode 5 and the zombie one was going to be number 7. They seemingly swapped the order of those two and due to the way that the watcher appears in the opening of this I think we can now confirm whether it was fake or not. If we look at how he appears in the zombie episode his face is completely looking over everything whereas here he's gone back a bit making me think that the order was indeed changed. A shout out to Philip Molina and the team at New Rockstars who I've been talking to about this for a week and I think that it finally confirms everything. I think eventually he will end up properly interacting with the characters and that this might break the multiverse open as he's clearly no longer keeping his distance. We know that coming down the line a lot of them are going to be interacting and him getting closer and closer could be hinting towards this. Now the episode asks the question, what if Thor was raised as an only child without his brother Loki? It reframes his entire life so that Odin didn't show pity upon him and take him to Asgard. Loki was of course responsible for the majority of issues in his brother's life and in the first Thor film he was the one who slipped the frost giants into Asgard so that they could steal the casket of ancient winters. This set Thor off on a path in which he travelled to Jotunheim and almost started a war with the frost giants which saw him cast out. He then ended up encountering S.H.I.E.L.D., defeated his brother, returned to Earth to stop him with the Avengers and it's clear that Loki is the most defining character in his life. Thus his absence sets him off in a totally new direction that seems, well it does seem a bit more fun, for a bit. Now we start off in New Mexico much like the beginning of Thor with Darcy and Jane sat in their truck. Similar to the opening of the movie they're observing an anomaly but unlike that film Dr. Eric Selvig is not with them. They're predicting this to be the apocalypse and in some ways they'd be right if you like 9pm bedtimes like your boy Kevin's spoilers. Now this is the first time that Jane brings up the alpha star Icarus which we learn was wiped out in a similar anomaly to what we see in the episode. Darcy says they're here and this is a nod to poltergeist namely when the ghosts came into the protagonist's home. However here it's a different kind of invasion and Thor has come to Midgard with the Warriors 3 and Sif. Now you might be asking why this Thor can wield the hammer and if you cast your mind back to Thor you'll remember that that ability was only taken away from him because Odin put a spell on it. Therefore it doesn't matter if he's worthy or not as in the opening of his first solo movie he could carry it even though he was a bit of a douche. In my Avengers Endgame breakdown a lot of people thought that Thanos was worthy because he managed to grab Stormbreaker and push it into Thor's chest but this was only because it didn't have a spell on it. However Mjolnir did and thus when fighting Cap Thanos grabbed his wrist instead of the hammer. Now what if I told you my wife calls me Wang the Conqueror? Well she doesn't, but she might and that's because for the last month I've been using Manscaped's new all-in-one performance package 4.0. This fourth generation kit is the best way to trim your infinity stones and it comes with a brand new lawnmower 4.0 body trimmer that provides a shave so close people will think that Razor Fist did it. 
The Lawn Mower 4.0 is the sleekest electric trimmer Manscaped have ever released, and not only is it waterproof, but it comes with advanced skin safe technology that provides a shave more stylized than Tony Stark's beard. It also has a super smart cordless charging system that gives you power for 90 minutes and LED lights that make it look like it's powered by the Arc Reactor. With it is an amazing travel lock feature as well, so it doesn't set off when you're on the go, and all you have to do to activate it is click the button three times. On top of this, the pack also has two products I didn't even know I needed until now, and that is the Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Reviver Ball Toner Spray. Simply apply the Crop Preserver after a shower for all day body odor protection, and use the Crop Reviver on your Infinity Stones any time of the day. Now I'm going to be honest yeah, I've got a, got a bit of a big snout, so the Weed Whacker was completely life changing. It helps to get the nose hairs right at the back, and it's also got the same skin safe technology that the lawnmower does, so you don't have to worry about cutting or tugging on sensitive hairs. Now for a limited time only, you also get two free gifts, and these include the anti-chafing boxer briefs, and also the amazing travel bag that puts a suit of armor around your kit wherever you go. Go to manscaped.com and get 20% off, as well as free international shipping when you enter Heavy 20 at the checkout. The link is in the description below and just enter a heavy 20 at the checkout for this life changing deal. I'm off to go save some lives, I'll see you next time or in the rest of this video. Now we cut back to Asgard to find Odin extremely weak in a bed, much like how he was in Thor. Due to the film he was powerless to stop Loki and there was a scene where he was joined by Frigga and Loki instead of Thor as he rested up. Here however, he's getting on a bit and he just needs to rest up and get those 9pm bedtimes in like your boy Kevin spoilers. We find Frigga at his bedside and she leaves the kingdom, telling Thor to have no parties, which if you've ever been a teenager means to have a party. Now we see Thor is clean shaven throughout the episode and I think that this is done on purpose to show he's not trying to live up to his father's image as much. Odin of course had a beard, which Thor also did, and it made them look very, very similar. Maybe Thor just never had the time to shave in the saga as he was pretty much always doing something world ending, so the fact that he's beardless here makes me think that he's had a much quieter life and therefore has had more time to do it. Or I could be reading too much into it and they've done that to differentiate the characters. Now moving on. She says Heimdall will be watching and this is of course a nod to his eyes which can see everything. He's basically Santa Claus minus the banter claws and he won't be letting any parties go on under his watchful eyes. Or so he thinks. Now together with the warriors and Sif, Thor travels into Odin's treasure room and in the background we can catch the fake infinity gauntlet. When the MCU first started out, many people thought that this was the real one, so were wondering how the infinity stones were off somewhere else, however it was quickly debunked as being fake due to it being for the wrong hand. The party rages on on earth and in the crowd you can spot the back of Yondu's head. It's not long until we see the executioner from Thor and the god of thunder hands him a beer which he says refills itself. This is due to magic, and it is possible that it's one of Doctor Strange's, which we saw refilling itself during their first meeting. Darcy and Jane go back and forth over whether to talk to Thor, and then we get a cameo by Howard the Duck, who, because of the events of this reality, never got caught by the Collector. Jane is clearly head over heels due to some slow-mo gazing, and Darcy rattles off just how amazing Thor looks. Throughout the MCU saga, whenever people have encountered him, they've often described how beautiful he looks, and this is no exception, especially with his clean shaven face. Now this is the perfect time to tell you about Manske- I'm just, I'm just kidding, I promise, I'm just kidding. Now we see the meeting of Jane Foster and Thor, and in this reality, rather than it being in the desert in New Mexico, it shifted slightly so that they meet in Las Vegas. Foster was very much a Florence Nightingale-esque character that fell in love with him, but here he's pretty much just boasting about how amazing he is, whilst getting scrolls to transform into him. This of course shows his vanity, as he's obsessed with staring at himself through their faces. Jane taps him on the shoulder, and he says she's so tiny. If you cast your mind back to the Avengers, the character actually called humans tiny when he was under the influence of the Mind Stone. This was clearly him showing his subconscious thoughts about humanity, but here he just blurts it out. Thor doesn't even know what the Norse God of Thunder is, and this shows how detached he is from caring about anything other than himself. Now he believes initially that she said Horse God, and this could be a reference to Beta Ray Bill, who is somewhat of a horse. Now next he offers Jane some food, and we see the Grandmaster cutting a giant cake, and the character is once more voiced by the infamous Chef Goldblum. He's joined by his right hand man, or woman in Topaz, 
who is carrying the disintegration stick that completely pardons you from life. Now later on we catch the Grandmaster on the decks and this is of course similar iconography to what we had in Thor Ragnarok when Loki and Thor came face to face for the first time after encountering Hela. Topaz was there too and ironically she died in Ragnarok when Bruce set off the birthday song and fireworks on the Grandmaster's ship. Now I was kind of hoping to see a jacked Grandmaster as we of course saw in episode 2 that his brother was. However he's the same old same old but you have to give the guy credit as he looks good and on most other planets he'd be, he'd be old so, mm, so. Now Jane once more brings up the Bifrost portal which wiped out the Alpha Star and it turns out that this was just Thor throwing another party and what a party it is. The night looks amazing and we watch the characters busting out dance moves so good that even Zemo would be jealous. Now next we see Nebula and Korg and I'm guessing that the former did end up being tortured by her father due to her cybernetic parts which were not present in episode 2. Either way, it looks like she's having fun and playing for a brand new eye and we also get several more cameos including Valkyrie and Drax. Turns out that you are out of luck until you've gone duck and we see Darcy getting shacked up with her brand new man Howard. Now I might be reaching here and I often do but is it just me or does the Elvis impersonator carrying out the wedding look a lot like a young Kurt Russell? Kurt of course played Ego in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 and personally I think that it's actually him. Now we see Thor and Jane getting tattoos together and these are magic and science which is a nod to the quote by Arthur C. Clarke, magic's just science that we don't understand yet. This was mentioned in the first Thor film and it's nice that they reference it here. We catch up in the morning after to find everyone suffering from a hangover and Jane says phone, phone over and over in a croaky voice which sounds very similar to E.T. who gets name dropped in this episode. Now that might be reaching and you might also be able to hear that I've got a very sore throat this morning which I'm calling a thaw throat, a throw throat, terrible. Now turns out that the call she made to S.H.I.E.L.D. at the start of the episode has come back to haunt her and both Maria Hill and Crossbones have been dispatched to bring her in. It's stuff like this which is why new rock stars and Canadian lad get more views than me isn't it? I'm absolutely terrible. Now it turns out that Nick Fury arrived to investigate the party but he was taken out by Korg performing a cannonball into a Vegas fountain. Amongst the quick shots you can also catch Rocket Raccoon in the sink and it looks like the little rabbit has seen better days. Thor refers to him as one and this is a callback to Infinity War in which he also called him the same thing. Next we cut to a helicarrier and learn from Agent Coulson that the party atmosphere is spreading across the globe and that it's slowly starting to destabilise it. Whilst Jane believes that this is Earth's first encounter with an alien life form, S.H.I.E.L.D. unveil that Captain Marvel actually came here before and though she's not technically an alien, she does have Kree DNA within her. The beeper she left with Fury was of course only to be used in extreme circumstances and it turns out that S.H.I.E.L.D. are just big party poopers. They activate it which starts up the Captain Marvel logo that we of course saw at the end of Infinity War. Back with Thor we see him taking selfies with Aisha aka the Golden High Priestess of the Sovereign who of course appeared in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. This moment is interrupted by Loki who has arrived looking a lot more like a frost giant than we've ever seen him before. Because of Frigga teaching him witchcraft and the diet of Asgard, Loki ended up looking very different to the typical frost giant however we see here that because he was raised by them that this variant looks exactly like them. Though he initially seems like he's going to be a bad guy, the pair are very much brothers from another mother and this of course was actually the case in the MCU. Loki only really went fully off the deep end due to learning of his true identity but not being lied to his entire life has meant that he's a much nicer guy. He does have a similar sort of crown to what Loki had in the MCU but this time it's made out of ice. Now at this point we hear a sonic boom and watch as Captain Marvel arrives on the planet much like how she did at the end of Endgame. I think it's hilarious how the locations like France and Belgium all have names that you can see from the sky and this is of course what you get on a map. Captain Marvel calls him White Snake, and this is in reference to the British band that were predominant in the 80s. Captain Marvel hasn't really been to Earth since the 90s so this is a timely reference for her that really shows her age. Now Brie Larson, bloody Brie Larson, she's here to ruin everyone's day and she ends up going toe to toe with Thor which could be the greatest threat to the party that anyone has ever seen. He ends up using a hammerang technique and this could be a subtle nod to when he pulled Stormbreaker to his hand in the beginning of Endgame 
but this time he didn't miss, eh? You having that, you, you bloody party pooper? Now, like Captain America did in the Avengers, she tells him to put the hammer down, but rather than hitting it against his shield, he sends Cap into Stonehenge. Stonehenge actually appeared in the MCU during Thor The Dark World, and it was the location Eric Selvig travelled to when he went a bit crazy. This fight takes place across the planet, and our next stopping point is the Grand Canyon, where we see both characters duke it out in one of the best battles in the season so far. I love how they fly over the skyline of the planet, and it feels very godly as they crash into clouds while thunder erupts around them. Thor ends up beating her by placing Mjolnir on her chest, and this is similar to what he did to Loki at the end of his solo film. Thor slams her in time out, and she ends up being branded a party pooper in a moment that feels like it was written by the quartering. Back on the helicarrier, she brings up her pet cat Goose, but at this time, I'm sure he was still on Earth and under Fury's care. I don't really care though, I'm not that much of a nerd, and they want Captain- well I am, but they want Captain Marvel to take Thor down, but due to her powers, this would destroy the party and also the planet. Instead, we need a different woman for the job, and this comes in the form of Jane, who wants to settle the situation without destroying North Dakota. After Loki destroys Thor's phone, Jane comes up with a plan to reach out to Frigga, who put an end to the party like any other parent would. Across the planet, we see Surtur chatting up the Statue of Liberty, and he says he's got a crown too, which was of course the source of his power in Ragnarok. However, he just ends up melting her arm off, and we see the destruction that he and the Frost Giants bring to the planet. They end up creating ice structures at Mount Rushmore, and this includes Loki crown thorns on Abraham Lincoln and also George Washington. We jump to Sydney and see that the Harbour Bridge has been turned into a dance floor. Now on the dance floor, we can catch Korg busting out the robot and sucking on a pacifier. This shot has several characters from the MCU, and next to him you will also notice Mantis. There's also a scroll and one of them uh, uh, fembots from Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 that Yondu serviced. I think I can still say that and keep it PG. Now there's also an Asgardian God, which I will now call an Asgod. I think this might actually be the same one that Loki imitated during Thor The Dark World. He did this after faking his death and used them to take the throne, but let me know below if you think it's really him or not. Now we can also catch Meek and Valkyrie, and just before Thor goes to slide down the opera house, he's once more approached by Captain Marvel. They end up fighting, but luckily Jane and Darcy make a noise so loud that it snaps Heimdall out of his slumber and he pulls her through to Asgard. He then sends her to go meet Frigga as the battle on Earth rages on. Just as the nukes are about to be launched, Frigga projects herself to the planet and gives her son a right good talking to. This de-escalates the problem and Crossbones feels bad they didn't get to fire the nukes because at this point he would of course been a part of Hydra. I feel kind of bad for Thor as he was just after a good time but now he's in deep trouble. We see Thor slowly start to become more like his father as he wants to clean up and he sees it as his duty to do so. As Frigga races towards Earth, he digs deep into his powers and commands the guests to put everything back exactly how it was. This includes Stonehenge, the Statue of Liberty's arm, Mount Rushmore, and he also puts the Leaning Tower of Pisa straight, which yeah, obviously it's meant to lean. Similar thing happened in Superman 2 as well, so might be a nod to that. Now Frigga is suspicious, but with a little help from Captain Marvel, she ends up buying it. Thor says so tiny, yet contains so much, and this of course symbolises how he viewed others doing a 180. However, the game is given away when Mjolnir returns covered in markings from the days before. Kinda reminds me of that time I threw a party and left one bottle cap on the carpet and got caught and in a lot of trouble. Now he ends up organising a day with Jane and we get somewhat of a happy ending until Ultron Infinite arrives through a portal. He carries not only the Infinity Stones with him, but also Vision's face and I'm guessing that this is from a reality in which he ended up shifting his consciousness into the synthetic body and this just made him unstoppable. Now because this episode of What If has ended on a cliffhanger, I know a lot of people will be a bit bummed out, but as we've been saying at the end of all our breakdowns, there is hope of a team up coming for the finale in two weeks time. In the second trailer for the show, we could catch several characters in an Avengers-esque lineup, and this included Killmonger, The Nora, T'Char Lord, and lastly Party Thor. This shows that the characters are definitely going to be interacting at some point, and though Marvel are infamous for putting fake things in their teasers, there is more evidence to support it. Last week the studio released a mid-season sneak peek look at what's to come, and in that we could catch Thor meeting with Strange Supreme. Strange Supreme seems to be the connector between every universe, as we already know from the second trailer that he's going to be meeting Captain Carter. 
So my guess is that he breaks out of his reality and then starts to unite the multiversal heroes in order to stop a greater threat. In this clip, Thor also mentioned zombies, so my guess would be that they pull one of the survivors from episode 5 and form a team with them. Thor has also been spotted in the teaser fighting Ultron bots in Las Vegas and therefore we can assume that the leaks about the finale being an Ultron centred one are indeed true. If you saw the Hyundai ad then you'll know that showed several of the heroes fighting against a legion of Ultron bots and it's likely that this is what will happen when the season draws to a close. As for next week we are apparently going to have a Gamora centric one in which he ends up wearing Thanos' armour. I'm going to guess that he was killed and that she ended up taking on her father's legacy in an attempt to balance the universe. We'll soon find out but I think that would be a very very cool concept. Now as for my thoughts on the episode, I think this was probably one of the weaker ones for me and though it had lots of cameos and easter eggs, I just wasn't as gripped as I was with the other entries. I don't know if it's because I'm a DC head at heart but I just love dark concepts and Infinity War is my favourite MCU movie because it takes a lot of the fun elements and subverts them so much. That's probably why I love the darker episodes of What If, but this, yeah, I, I sound a bit down but it was still pretty good. I know a lot of people in my comments have been saying that the tone of What If, namely the back to back Tony deaths, kinda made the season seem very bleak, so if this was originally episode 5 then that might have brought a bit more levity to the situation so it didn't feel like gut punches back to back. Obviously we really don't know, but it's led to the series feeling somewhat depressing. And that's kind of what you expect when you release things on a Wednesday. Anyway, that wraps up the video and obviously I'd love to hear your thoughts on the episode and your predictions for the future. We are running a competition right now and giving away three copies of the Zack Snyder DC Trilogy on the 30th of September and all you have to do to be in with a chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the episode. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month and the winners of the last one are on screen right now, so if that's you then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch then make sure you check out our breakdown of what if episode 6 which will be linked on screen right now. We went over the full thing and pointed out all the easter eggs we could find so definitely go check it out right after this. With that out of the way thank you for sticking through the video, I've been Paul, you take care of yourself and I'll see you next week. Peace and have a good week as well. A Peace.